Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Spirit of the Heart Leaders Forum for Prince George's County. This evening is hosted by the Association of Black Cardiologists Incorporated and the University of Maryland Capital Region Medical Center. I am Dr. Barbara Hutchinson, a cardiologist at Chesapeake Cardiac Care and a past president of the Association of Black Cardiologists. As a longtime member or resident, I should say, of Prince George's County and a cardiologist in the area, I have seen firsthand the devastating impact that <clears throat> heart disease and health disparities has had on our community. Tonight, we are here to help bring awareness about heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and other cardiovascular risk factors to our communities so that we can begin to use new resources in our community to take action to address the problem that currently exists. We are approaching two years of deal, dealing with coronavirus and the devastating effect that it has had on our community. We have had over 10,000 deaths from COVID-19 in Maryland. And while it is important to recognize the risk of COVID and make sure to get vaccinated, we must still pay attention to the number one cause of death, not only in Prince George's County, but in the United States, and that is heart disease. So I would like to thank you for joining this community forum. In addition, I also want to extend a special thanks to the symposium planning team, the volunteers, and of course, our sponsors. Programs such as this would not be successful without the continued support of our partners. Before we begin this great program this evening, I would like you to hear from Dr. <clears throat> Paul Underwood, the past, past president of the Association of Black Cardiologists and chair of the community programs for the association. Following this, his message, we will hear from Governor Larry Hogan, followed by a message from Mr. Nathaniel Richardson, the president of the, of the hospital here in Prince George's County, University of Maryland, Capital Region Medical Center. Great, well, thank you, Dr. Hutchinson. Hi, I am Paul Underwood, an interventional cardiologist and former president and co-chair of the Association of Black Cardiologists Community Programs Committee. It is with heartfelt pleasure that I welcome you to this year's Prince George's County Spirit of the Heart event. For the past 47 years, the ABC has advocated for the health of our black and brown communities that have been hardest hit by cardiovascular diseases such as stroke, heart failure, and sudden death. I'm sure that many of you out there know exactly what I'm talking about because either you or someone that you know have had issues with their heart in the past. Although the steps to prevention are straightforward, avoiding tobacco, watching your blood pressure, controlling diabetes, the road to good health is often rocky with many barriers along the way. The Spirit of the Heart is ABC's signature program to educate community members and inform community leaders on the best path forward to remove heart disease from our communities. In 1974, our community intervention programs began in Baltimore with church and barbershop hypertension screening centers. Over time, they've changed, and with this current coronavirus pandemic, they have morphed into this virtual format. We at the ABC applaud your engagement and participation in this year's event. Just as it takes a village to raise a child, we believe that we need input from all, people like you, doctors, the nurses, elected officials, research scientists, and our youth to make a meaningful impact to remove heart disease from our community. If you are interested in learning more about the ABC and our programs, 
such as community health advocate training or continuing medical education, please visit our website, abcardio.org, or drop your info into the chat box so we can follow up with you. I hope you enjoy and benefit from this evening's wonderful program. Be sure to interact with us through the chat or the Q&A. And remember, children should know their grandparents and become great grandparents too. Thank you. Now we are happy to have a message from the governor of our great state, Mr. Larry Hogan, followed by greetings from Mr. Nathaniel Richardson, president of the University of Maryland Capital Region Health Hospital. Good evening. It's an honor to join you virtually for the Association of Black Cardiologists Spirit of the Heart Leaders Forum. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted all of us in a variety of ways, but it has sharply highlighted the great disparities in health outcomes that continue to burden minority communities, especially those who suffer from comorbidities and cardiovascular diseases. Today's program will bring together health professionals and leaders to come up with solutions that can be used to address these disparities and close the gap on health outcomes for patients with heart diseases. All of us have a role to play in this very important work. And I wanna thank you, our healthcare heroes, for your leadership. I look forward to working with all of you to make progress and continue to fight for a healthier and more equitable Maryland. Thank you. I'm Matt Richardson and I have had the privilege to serve as president and CEO at the University of Maryland Capital Region Health for the past 17 months. We are honored and humbled you are sharing your valuable time to assist with the Spirit of Heart program this evening. When we opened the new medical center in June, we did so with the intent to establish more partnerships to address the disease burdens in Prince George's County and surrounding areas. And cardiovascular disease is one of the top healthcare disparities to solve for in Prince George's County. With your scientific knowledge and medical expertise, Capital Region Medical Center will be well positioned to help combat this disease and improve the health of Prince George's and surrounding counties. Again, thank you for joining us and together we can make our community better, stronger and healthier. I look forward to this expert panel. Cardiovascular disease is near and dear to me. It's a passion of mine. I had a father who passed away with valvular heart disease at 63 in 1998 on Father's Day. And it has been my mission since that day to do everything that I can to help with the cause of cardiovascular medicine and making sure that I do everything as a leader to support these efforts in curing and helping those with cardiovascular disease. So thank you so much again for your time this evening. And I look forward to partnering, not just this evening, but in the future as we walk beside each other in curing cardiovascular disease. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Hogan. We would like to thank Mr. Uh, Nathaniel Richardson for those words of remarks. Addressing heart disease and reducing disparities is important to all of us in Maryland, especially in Prince George's County. If we are to make changes necessary to reduce deaths from heart disease, then we need to work together on solutions that help solve the problems. But how big is this problem of cardiovascular disease in Prince George's County? Our next speaker, Dr. James Brown will provide us with the current state of health in Prince George's County. Dr. James Brown is the Vice President and Medical Director of the Heart and Vascular Institute for the University of Maryland Capital Region Health. Please welcome Dr. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Hutchinson. Um, and thank you to the ABC for the the honor of the floor for the next few minutes, um, I would like, I hope, to stimulate some thought and discussion pertaining to health disparity and cardiovascular disease burden.
So this is um, old news, but always worth reviewing. At a death of every 40 seconds and a projected cost by 2030 of $8,800 billion, um, cardiovascular disease is still our number one problem. In Prince George's County, population of roughly 900,000, um, with 62% Black Americans, there is an extremely high cardiometabolic syndrome rate and death rate. Ellen, can you go back a slide? There's a little bit of delay and I hit it twice. There we go. I can't point, but if you look at three o'clock from the point of the square, the yellow line going through the blue dots, that's where we are in Largo, clearly right in the heart of an extremely high incidence of cardiometabolic syndrome. Here on the vertical axis are deaths per 100,000 people. A black male compared to a white male, these trend lines have been decreasing. The mortality has been decreasing and um, continues to decrease to this day. However, the dis disparity persists. And in the next slide, shown more starkly on the vertical axis, is cardiovascular disease death rates uh, from the CDC per 100,000 populace. To the left, the blue bar, white male. To the right, orange bar, black male. If this doesn't point out disparity or burden, I don't know what else could. Um, Puckrin, in about 2015, um, wrote a paper in the most stunning calculation he made in the paper uh, based on a bunch of data was that about 47 million Americans probably have cardiometabolic syndrome More on that in a second. But in the black American population, he calcula calculated a loss of 12 million years of life annually. I think that's seismic and stunning, should get anybody's attention and at that feel the burden. Cardiometabolic syndrome is a combination of metabolic and pathophysiologically linked dysfunctions, insulin resistance, impaired glucose tolerance, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and central adiposity. In the black population, there is an especially high pernicious link between the end organ glucose intolerance, vasoconstriction, hypertension, and also renal failure that plays into this picture that creates a perfect storm. Going locally from the health department website, if you're going to think about how do you control this, three out of every four Prince Georgians, um, Prince Georgian adults are obese or overweight. One out of every two Prince Georges uh, do not get the recommended uh, basic physical activity. And then to tackle diabetes, in the middle there, you can see Prince George's County. Again, the square box mocks Washington, D.C. If you go to the point on the square at 3 o'clock, that's us. Um, and in a bad way, in this density map, the incidence of diabetes, 12.3 there next to Prince George's County, is amongst the highest and the highest in the country. So, accordingly, we have been given by the CDC a preventable death rate. And that's, in a very general sense, all maneuvers and prevention maneuvers that could have prevented the disease. We'll work on more of that later. Into this backdrop, um, enter the COVID pandemic. Um, Prince George's County uh, in this map is right next to Washington, D.C. there. And we were um, literally COVID central. Uh, in the top 10 counties in the country for COVID incidents. And even now we're, we're high ranking. These uh, circles, which should represent disease incidents, look more like a nuclear detonation. Perhaps that was more the truth. Ranking number one in COVID's not a good thing. In spite of all that, with this bit humorous uh, rendition uh, from the, the Hopkins uh, uh, website and data tracker, just to point you to this in a high-risk situation, 
in a high-risk population in, with smaller distances and spaces with as much COVID as anybody in the country. In the lower right, you'll see still the, co the COVID county fatality rate was less than the state and national rate. So between what everybody did at the state and county uh, level, the uh, University of Maryland, Maryland system, all the strategies that were deployed rapidly to care for COVID patients, and let's not forget all the providers at the bedside who provided this care. Um, a good job was done, hats off, and a nod to all. Furthermore, there's Prince George's County in the dark blue in the middle of the page, and in this case, darker is better. The vaccination rate, at least one vaccination dose of over 70%, and that given the uphill battle to win hearts and minds and get this job done, Again, hats off, head nod to everybody involved in this um, initiative. Getting back to heart disease during the COVID pandemic, oddly, acute coronary syndromes were down uh, in this publication from New York State, down 40%, and hospitalizations from acute MI from the Kaiser publication in the New England Journal in California, you can see 2019 compared to 2020, as the COVID pandemic hit. Clearly, um, I don't think any of us likely believe that there is something magically protective about getting a uh, COVID disease against severe coronary artery disease here pictured a critical stenosis in the left main coronary artery. Um, the deaths are likely all mixed up with the COVID deaths or uh, it's the storm that's about to hit. So to flip this topic upside down and back into some numbers. What I'd like to do is just present here on this slide, standard utilization rights across the country for surgical interventions with, which prevent death all by level one evidence. For, Alan, can you go back one slide? For, for cabbage, for example, 397,000 two years ago done in the country, our population is 333 million as we speak. So, for example, cabbage utilization rates can vary, but um, they are done by level of one evidence to save lives. Same with heart valve surgery, repair of arteries and aneurysms. Somehow I'm advancing uh, automatically, I apologize. Here, the demonstration is the prevalence of diabetes in the United States from 2004 to 2016. Your eye goes to the dark colors in the South, but in addition, I'd like you to look west of the Mississippi and look at the rest of the United States in 2016. Those numbers and those utilization numbers are not going to get better. They're actually going to get worse. The need is going to get worse. But let's just take an example. Even with an extremely conservative utilization rate of 0.65 per 1,000 population, then from Prince George's County alone, there should be 588 cabbages done a year. But this is assuming normal disease prevalence, incidence, access to care, awareness, and compliance. And all five of those are likely false assumptions. So to expand the calculation and create the image of the iceberg underneath, Based on level one evidence, the procedures below in just cardiac and vascular surgery should be performed. Valves, major thoracic aorta, vascular procedures totaling 2,000 major cardiovascular procedures per year done to prevent death based on level one evidence. And so I would say based on this and the, the fact that there are probably historic, historically 500 open heart operations from Prince George's County, more than half of which historically have left the county, then the population is perhaps underserved, underutilized, and the healthcare is underutilized. So even if we went and fixed it all now, had everybody in the doctor, the primary care physicians referred their patients to the cardiologists, there was enough of those doctors to go around to then perform these procedures to save lives, we'd still be a long way away from uh, fixing our problem. So the burden is something we can't run from and we can't hide from 
And so the question is, what do we do? What would be the strategy? Because it's a hospital strategy, it's a community strategy. There's a lot of education and learning and discovery involved. And just by way of example, within the hospital, within this, this, this beautiful new hospital in Prince George's County, we collectively decided that we needed to be organized with cardiovascular care and have created a Heart and Vascular Institute structure with the patient in the middle of the thinking, services and hospital operations, kind of hugging the, the patient is uh, schematized in this, in this graph. No way to do this piecemeal. It's got to be organized. And this, this thinking has to go to the, the community and to I'll stop there. Thank you, everyone, for this honor. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for that presentation. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Joseph Wright, and I am Senior Vice President and the Chief Medical Officer for the University of Maryland Capital Region Health. And it, it gives me um, great pleasure to be uh, with the Association of Black Cardiologists for this program this evening. I am, am a longstanding resident of Prince George's County. So the information that Dr. Brown has shared is um, uh, very close to my family and my neighbors and, and the people that we obviously care for at the University of Maryland Capital Region Medical Center. Uh, I am also a uh, emergency physician by background. And what I'd like to do is to share with you a, a parable that epitomizes the work that we uh, are doing and intend to do in partnership with organizations like the, the Association of Black Cardiologists uh, as we tackle this challenge of cardiovascular disease. A man is standing by a river when he hears a cry for help. He sees someone struggling in the water on the verge of drowning. Being an expert swimmer, he jumps in and rescues the victim. Before he has a chance to rejoice in his success, however, he sees someone else floating by, also crying for help. As soon as he rescues this person, he discovers a third, then a fourth and a fifth. More and more victims float by, taxing his swimming stamina. Finally, he walks away. When asked where he's going, he replies, I'm going up the river to stop people from falling in. I share that parable because historically, the Capital Region Medical Center and its predecessor has been that institution that has been in the gap, in the river, with our, our uh, cardiac intervention program and our very busy emergency department and, and fishing people out of the river. Uh, this is a, a very taxing, as the parable states, task. And I'm happy to report, as Dr. Brown mentioned at the end of his presentation, that we've made a concerted commitment to get upstream, to get up the river, to be preventive and to address cardiovascular disease at its, at its source. So in February of 2020, we launched the Heart and Vascular Institute. And this is significant because as Mr. Richardson noted, we just moved on to our new campus on June 12th of 2021. Yet we thought that it was critical to get ahead with this programming and to get ahead with the infrastructure to support a very concerted and a very deliberate approach to cardiovascular disease before we moved. So February of 2020, through the pandemic, uh, we have been, been taking step by step building that infrastructure. And we remain committed to continuing to address the disparities that you've heard about and will hear about through the course of this evening's program by attacking the structural inequities that fuel them. So for instance, 
our Heart and Vascular Institute is committed to building access, building access so that we can, again, address and attack cardiometabolic disease at its source. So for instance, a novel program aligning our women's health program with our cardiovascular program, addressing the link between uh, uh, obstetrical um, uh, disease or not even a disease, but uh, obstetrics and hypertension, a collaboration between two very talented physicians, Dr. Sheila Woodhouse, uh, who is one of our preventive cardiologists, part of the Heart and Vascular Institute, and Dr. Kerry Lewis, who is our chair of obstetrics and gynecology. Um, that is just one small example. You also will hear about our, our structural intervention program from Dr. Clarence Finley, who's a member of our panel this evening. So I, I just want to make sure that you all are, are, are fully aware of our programmatic, as well, of our, as well as our philosophical commitment to get upstream, to address cardiovascular disease at its course, of course, uh, at its root, of course, continuing to be that center of choice for those who have acute manifestations of cardiovascular disease. We are an accredited cardiac intervention center and have a very, very active uh, catheterization lab and are doing some great work there. So without further ado, I will move the program along to our panel. And the moderator for our panel is Dr. Sarah Collins. I will let her um, introduce that portion of the program. Thank you so much again to the Association of Black Cardiologists for allowing us to collaborate uh, with the program tonight. And we certainly look forward to uh, a very robust relationship going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, for enlightening us on the state of affairs in Prince George's County and Dr. Wright for just sharing with us all the opportunities that are available to us through the University of Maryland Capital Region here in Prince George's County. We will now hear more from our panel about what several organizations are currently doing in addressing cardiovascular disease here in the county and also to explore ways that perhaps we can do more to bridge the gap that exists in our communities that are preventing us from really achieving better health. I would like to introduce now Dr. Sarah Collins, who will moderate this discussion. Please welcome Dr. Collins. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Sarah Collins, a cardiologist at Chesapeake Cardiac Care. I'm honored to facilitate this discussion tonight. We'll be discussing tackling the gaps in care of cardiovascular disease in our, in our community. And I'd like to begin by having our panelists introduce themselves and the organizations that they represent. I'm Dr. Wright, since you've already been introduced, let's move on to Dr. Carter. Good, good evening, I'm Dr. Ernest Carter. I'm the health officer at Prince George's County. Wonderful. Dr. Finley? Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Clarence Findley. I'm actually a resident of Prince George's County. I grew up here, went to high school here, and I'm happy to return home to provide care for those in the county. Um, I am an interventional cardiologist with interest in coronary and structural heart disease. I work with uh, Capital Cardiology Associates as well as the University of Maryland Capital Regional Medical Center uh, to help try and bridge the gap and, and hopefully bring a higher level of care to Prince George's County from a cardiology standpoint. Thank you. Great. Mr. Tate. Good evening, everybody. My name is James Tate. I am a holistic wellness practitioner and nutrition therapist, and I'm also a health minister in Prince George's County, currently serving at the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden as the director of the Body by Christ Ministry. Wonderful. We're getting so many incredible perspectives. And last but not least, Dr. Ashton, are you there? I am here. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stacy Ashton, and I am the principal of Burnt Mills Elementary School in Silver Spring, Maryland. 
I've been the principal there for eight years. Um, and Dr. Brown was my heart surgeon. Um, I am a heart disease survivor. And Dr. Brown uh, performed open heart surgery on me in 2017. And I am serving tonight as a patient advocate. I am also a resident of Prince George's County. Wonderful. So now I'd like to invite the audience to submit questions in the chat for our panelists. Just pop them in the chat below and we will get to them um, first come, first serve. So let's go ahead and start with Dr. Carter. Um, are you there? Oh, there you are. Um, what activities has the Prince George's County Health Department been involved in around, imp around improving the health of the residents of Prince George's County of late? Well, you know that I'm, as the health officer, my top job is in my top priority is to improve the health of Prince George's, our, our Prince Georgians. The health department provides a wide variety of services and programs to help people with their health care, to promote health, and to do all of those upstream uh, practices that uh, Dr. Wright was mentioning. You know, we have an environmental health division that inspects food and our water and our sewer system, our swimming pools. We have a division of health and wellness that does diabetes prevention, uh, trains lifestyle coaches, have nutrition classes, have nurses go to people's home to make sure they're living a healthy lifestyle and can do the things that they need to do at home. And, and we have a family health services division that, as you all well know, does immunizations, dental care, tuberculosis control, maternal child health, uh, STI um, testing and treatment, as well as all of the COVID work that we've been doing. And with a big emphasis also on HIV and HIV prevention, we want to get rid of it in, in my lifetime, or actually in the next five years. Our behavioral health division works primarily doing overdose response and training, outpatient substance abuse counseling, maternal health crisis services, adolescent recovery, and, and it goes on and on. We do a lot of work, as you all well know, to help our, our Prince George's County folks really maintain their health. And to find out all of the things we're doing, if you could go to health.mypgc.us to find out all of our services. Thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, it's it's so important as, as Dr. Brown was describing this sort of hug that we're giving our patients with all these different collaborative services. Um, it's so important to hear how your department and your team is integrating these services um, because as we are sort of smothered with the pandemic, um, all of the other disease burdens, cardiovascular disease really at the helm um, have really been pushed to the surface and stressed. Our system is so stressed. So it's, um, it's really important that we, we sort of treat this with a multi multidisciplinary approach. And sort of speaking of the pandemic, Dr. Finley, um, we're approaching our second year of the coronavirus, um, hard to believe. You know, I'm curious to know how your practice has sort of pivoted to address the, the cardiovascular needs of the community as we are also fighting this, this battle with coronavirus. I think that's a great question. I don't, I, I wouldn't say that it has pivoted. I think it's been sort of steadfast. Um, we definitely know that a lot of individuals have uh, been staving off coming in when they experience symptoms because there was some concern initially around COVID that has seemed to trail off. Uh, we definitely have had a surge in some of the acute MIs and things of that nature. So it's at least good people are starting to access care. Um, I think one of the things to highlight for a lot of patients is the fact that you know, we want them to continue to be steadfast, to continue to exercise, to continue to see their providers, to do everything it is that they need to do to ensure that they have not only a long life, but a, a good quality life. And I think that's actually uh, the most important. Um, in addition to that, I think some of the other things to highlight are some of the things that we hope to, to provide for our Prince George's County residents coming down the pike. Um, you know, in addition to uh, interventional cardiology work, uh, basic stenting, we'd like to sort of move into offering some of these things that are offered in some of our surrounding counties. Uh, in particular, things like left atrial appendage occlusion devices, uh, valve replacements that could be done percutaneously, meaning through the skin and not without uh, or, or without an incision, 
Um, these things have become relatively routine in other parts of the country, and in fact, in other parts of the DMV, but they're not taking place here in the county. And so we want to change that rubric and give our residents uh, a, a home to come to, a place where they'll know they'll be taken care of, um, and where their concerns will be held in high regard and addressed. Um, this is sort of the vision, I think, going forward over the next three to five years uh, for uh, Capital Regional, um, the Capital Regional Medical Center and uh, its cardiology component. Yes, what I hear, you know, you and Dr. Wright and Dr. Carter saying is that the, you know, this new beautiful hospital and this incredible team that's now expanded um, is, is really an opportunity for us to dig in and tackle disease that has been present all along and is, is, is really sort of laid dormant over the past couple of years since we've been battling this pandemic. So for the patients in the audience, um, touch base with your with your team, touch base with your primary doc, your cardiologist. Um, I, I've been seeing a lot of patients in, in our practice. I, I'm blessed enough to work with Dr. Hutchinson. A lot of patients in our practice have really been quiet and, and dormant and stayed inside as they were instructed to. Um, but a lot of disease and symptoms and medications have been missed. So now is the time to touch base with, with, your, with your trusted health providers and let us give you a once over, um, cry on our shoulder um, and help us help you so that we can get to all of, these, um, all of these issues and these incredible services that the hospital is providing. I'm really happy to hear that, um, that that's on the table. Um, you know, as a, as a patient, Dr. Ashton, can you give us a little advice um, as providers on how we can uh, do a better job of reaching you, talking to you, um, advocating for you? How you can um, do a better job of advocating for someone such as myself? I would think just um, forums such as this, a town hall meeting where, we're, where we have the opportunity to engage and collaborate and discuss uh, what's important in our community, and that's really our health care, and making sure that our Prince Georgians and other um, folks around the region really have opportunities to reach out to their health care providers when they have questions or concerns about their health, and that they're able to reach out to their health care providers in such a way that is easy and accessible. Um, I know for me, um, in my situation, having a heart attack was the last thing I thought I was actually having um, in 2017. But when it, when everything actually went, uh, occurred, I mean, I had the best care. Um, Dr. Brown and his team, they provided stellar care. And they not only took care of me while I was in the hospital, it was post care after I left the hospital and I came home, um, they checked on me. I had my, you know, my post care visits and, um, Dr. Brown and his team checked on me. Um, even when I went back to work, he was he checked on me to make sure I was okay. So I think you know having that bedside manner goes beyond just um, being in the hospital in the bed. It really extends out into into the community, to your homes. And I think if as as doctors and physicians, if you could just extend your your practice beyond the hospital walls, it would really help. Um, and a lot of ways. That's great to hear. We'll do our best. Um, Mr. Tate, I have a question from the audience for you. And it reads, what can we do to change the mindset of older people in our families who are not open to change in the area of health? Wow, that's a great question. That's it's actually a, one. It's a million dollar question. And it's, it, it, you really have to take an individualized approach because everyone does not have the, the same mindset. Um, but as a health minister, the most important thing that I can say is you have to pray for that person first and foremost. You have to model healthy eating, healthy living for that person as well. And if that person is a uh, believer in Christ, you have to introduce those wellness scriptures, which is something that 
that we're doing right now. Those scriptures are often overlooked. Um, we have a lot of churches that treat the Bible like trail mix. You pick out your favorite pieces and throw the rest away. And so we want to reintroduce those wellness scriptures because God loaned us these multi-million dollar vessels. Uh, and he gave us instructions on how to take care of them. And so we're reintroducing people to those scriptures. And it's great to introduce those to people, whether they're senior citizens or to children, um, so that they know how to take care of their bodies if, you know, to follow the Lord as, as best as they can. Dr. Collins. I am on mute. I was just echoing Mr. Tate's words and saying that leading by example um, is, is so, so, so important. Uh, and there are a lot of people, you have a lot of fans in this chat, Mr. Tate. Um, you're getting a lot of, you're getting a lot of applause. So I will echo those applause to you. Um, okay. So let's move on to, um, let me see if there's one more question in the chat here. Okay. Well, actually, this is a good question for you, less as a patient, but more as a as a, a, a person in the community who's dealing with our children. Um, you know, one of the one of the audience members asked if you see any issues with our kids. And I think that they're, they're really this is not really as much about cardiovascular disease, but it is just about the sort of general wellness of our children. And this is, you know, a wellness discussion. So, Dr. Ashton, do you see any sort of you know, general issues with our children? Absolutely, and that is an excellent question because, you know, returning to the schoolhouse after almost 18 months of virtual learning, um, there has definitely been an impact on our, our students and our scholars. Um, I see uh, a social emotional wellness impact where our scholars are really um, experiencing some trauma um, because of the uh, effects of the pandemic. So in particular at my school, we have, um, I've implemented a trauma sensitive school where we have begun the discussion around what is it that we need to do to begin to unpack the trauma that our students have faced as a result of COVID-19, whether it be a loss of a family member, whether it be um, someone in their family that um, contracted COVID, um, and not only just with the pandemic, but with the social um, injustices that have been happening over the last few years, it has created um, you know, a real black cloud in some ways um, with our, our students um, at all ages. And when our students returned to the schoolhouse, we could really see that um, they needed some wraparound services, not just the students, but families. So um, having a support system, having staff who are trained and able to work with um, our students who are in need um, is really important. So in addition to just recognizing that there's trauma and, and not using or thinking that the word trauma is a bad word. We often think trauma, you know, it's a you know, it's, it's, a, it's a stigma behind the word trauma. We've all experienced trauma and we have to really deal with it and unpack mental health in a real way. And it's, it is affecting our students. And we have some uh, best practices and strategies at my school that we have implemented that are really making a difference um, with, our, with my students. And so besides trauma, the social emotional well-being um, is definitely an issue. And then when we think about um, just un unhealthy eating habits and lack of exercise is also um, something, uh, a pause for concern um, with, our scholar, with our students. I'm sorry, we call our, I call my students scholars. So I use that term uh, interchangeably with students, but just unhealthy eating habits and lack of exercise um, is a road to possibly heart disease. Because you know, if you're, if you're not eating healthy, if you're um, you're not exercising, you know, you're you're not giving your body what it needs. So those are just a few things that I think that we really need to um, consider when we think about the well-being of our students. Yeah, in many ways, um, those same needs and concerns and issues and traumas 
are happening at every age level. Um, and I know that for those of us who are practicing in whatever practice, we may, it may be ministry practice or cardiology practice or health practice, we are seeing the juxtaposition of mental illness, untreated mental illness with cardiovascular disease. And for anybody who has an anxious family member, anxious patient, depressed patient, depressed family member, we all know we can't even get to the cardiovascular disease until we tackle the depression or we tackle the anxiety, tackle the trauma. So um, I, I agree, it's so important to use those words openly and to create a dialogue with your, with your family and with your ministry and with your patients um, so they feel comfortable having, having a conversation about their needs and, and, and sort of crawling out from, from under this immense um, burden of, of just multifactorial issues that we're, that we're all dealing with. Um, and, you know, our, our new hospital has, has a, a, all the, but that, that I'm just keep going back to that, it, that graphic that Dr. Brown put up with all of the services, um, it's all there. So we just gotta, we just gotta have those conversations. Um, so actually this is a question I'm actually gonna ask Dr. Wright from the audience. Um, I think cause Dr. Brown is, is off here. So uh, what resources are available Dr. Wright for people who are having cardiac emergencies or helping people after they've been discharged with a new major cardiac diagnosis? Let me come off a of mute. Yes, and, uh, and, and thank you for that question. I, I believe that was Dr. Underwood. I, this is something that I, I was remiss in not referencing in my opening remarks uh, that, um, uh, again, we are a uh, accredited cardiovascular intervention center. So that's 24-7, 365, that we have um, uh, board certified and and very excellent interventional cardi cardiologists at the ready for individuals having cardiac emergencies. And, and we have a very busy um, cardiac intervention center. Our cath lab is uh, uh, very active. We also are a primary stroke center. Uh, so uh, those individuals um, uh, experiencing stroke symptoms. And one thing I do want to mention, Dr. Collins, which I, I, I found very interesting uh, along the lines of the work that uh, the Association of Black Cardiologists does in terms of uh, public education. When we had our most recent site visit for our stroke center, the reviewer commented that our community had among the highest rate of EMS transport of individuals having stroke symptoms of any jurisdiction that they'd seen. And that is a proxy for the public being educated to stroke symptoms and calling 911 and getting to the stroke center in a, in a timely fashion. And of course, um, uh, you know, every minute spared is brain spared when it comes to stroke. And I, I thought that that was, a, again, a testament to the kind of work that the Association of Black Cardiologists and other organizations are doing with regard to public education. And the last part of the question asks about um, the follow-up. Now, we have a, a, a new regional medical center, but we also have a health system that is actually spread across another four campuses in the county, uh, in Laurel, in Bowie, uh, we have um, uh, offices at the National Harbor, as well as primary care practices in, in, in Suitland. You heard Dr. Finley uh, mentioned that he is situated with capital cardiologists. So we have a number of access points for folks uh, who, who need their uh, primary care needs met. And primary care is in lockstep with cardiovascular care. And so I, I wanna emphasize for those participating tonight that yes, uh, we have a brand new medical center, but the health system itself in Prince George's County um, has a number of access points. We have an emerging wellness campus in Laurel, which will be coming online next year, uh, which again, uh, when we talk about prevention and we talk about getting upstream, these are important elements of the uh, of the whole comprehensive approach to cardiovascular disease that 
um, we want the community to take advantage of. That's, that's wonderful to hear. Um, all right, we've got a lot of questions coming in. Dr. Underwood is on fire over here. Um, first, this question I'm going to pose to you, Dr. Finley, since you are our man on the street. Uh, the question reads, outline specific steps that would help patients and providers to partner with one another to improve patient health care. All right, patients and providers to partner with one another. I mean, I think um, part of it is, is kind of what we've been advocating, right? And that is to reestablish care if you've, if, kind of, if you've allowed that to drop off uh, during these COVID times. So making sure that you're following up making sure that you're going to, to, to see your provider, keep them in close contact. If there are any issues, you make sure you get them addressed and don't allow them to linger and say, well, I think it's something else. I think it's something else. And next thing you know, we're in an emergency situation and have to move fast. And those, that, those are scenarios where the risk of bad things happening increase tremendously, as you well know, Dr. Collins. Um, but I, I would say that that's sort of probably the, the biggest area that, that I would um, I really want to push the several patients. I'll give you an example. Friday night came in and a lot of them, the story was more of I haven't really been to the doctor in the past three years because of COVID. I'm not taking an aspirin and I've had a four vessel bypass. Right. So these are things that we would really push on our patients and we would really urge and advocate for doing the basic things to try to keep them out of the hospital, taking medications, exercising, doing, you know, going for walks, doing some of these things and also watching their diet. A lot of these things have falling, fallen um, um, uh, to the wayside for a lot of these patients. So again, getting back to basics, seeing your provider, eating right, taking your medications, all the basic things, I think that's where we need to come back to. And once you're in the fold, we all can kind of do what we need to do to direct you to the places that you need to be and to ensure that that provider and patient relationship stays strong. The other side of it, I think, is customer service, right? And so, you know, a lot of people, at least from my standpoint, I've always... I'm a physician, yes, but at the end of the day, I serve my patients and I, I, I see myself uh, as a servant. Um, and, and that is to try to help patients get or, or optimize their health as best possible. And I think if you have that approach, it enables you to build relationships with your patients uh, such that they feel very comfortable telling you things, approaching you um, uh, and, and, and accessing you when they need to and not necessarily uh, create a scenario where they try to avoid you at all costs. And so I think that's the other side of things. So as providers, we need to ensure that we are providing the appropriate customer service that, that patients feel like they can come to us and talk to us about whatever it is um, so that we can uh, provide the most effective care. So this kind of holistic approach, I think, is really what uh, needs to be touted. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think so much of what we do is just listening. Um, and, and now we're strategizing because we haven't seen some of our patients for a couple of years. Um, so a lot of it is listening and building a plan together. Um, so for all the patients out there, don't try to do it alone at home. Um, listen to us, let us help you, let us serve you. Okay, another question, this actually is a great question for Dr. Carter. Um, another question from Dr. Underwood, where can legislators direct funding from Prince George's County to continue expanding its health mission? Oh, I think that there are several points for, to do that. One, if, if you start thinking about programmatic areas, we can talk about areas that uh, center around population health and care coordination with, with uh, um, Dr. Finley just alluded to, because uh, in, in the clinical setting, people only have so much time to spend with a patient, but care teams have time to help coordinate that patient's care, making sure they get to the doctor, make sure they get to the health needs that they need. And that's all about making sure that there are care, care teams that can be available, community health workers that can help people, health literacy, which we're, we're emphasizing now. What, do you, what does a patient need to talk to a doctor about? And what does, how does a doctor talk to a patient? What are their real needs? All of those things are in the public health realm. And there are programs that can be directed toward hospital systems, as well as public health systems, and, and all, of, all of the coordinated systems that have to be a part of these care teams. So we, we're, we would look at program, definitely look at programmatic areas. And then you also could direct funding to capital areas there in, within Prince George's County. There's a need for places for people to go when they have mental health, uh, to take the burden off the emergency room 
people who have in mental health crisis where they don't need to be in an inpatient for a long time. They just need a short stay. We need dollars for from behavioral health all the way to new buildings to do uh, uh, public health. <laughs> I, I put my own plug in. <laughs> so, so I would just say that there are many places in there are, are uh, the people here on the phone, like Dr. Wright and Dr. Collins, and we all can contribute to the, to tell, talking about what type of legislation needs to be performed for the type of funding that we need. Absolutely. I'm going to pose this question to the group, and I'm going to include you, Dr. Brown, if you're still there, you can answer and turn your camera on. But this is one that actually probably a lot of people on this panel could potentially answer. Um, Dr. Hutchinson is asking about cardiac rehab um, after, after interventions or surgery. And what kind of services are we, do we have available to the community? Am I, am I un unmuted? Can you hear me? You're unmuted. We can hear you loud and clear. Awesome. I'll take that if I may. Um, we have we have a rehab program at the hospital, but to speak more generically, I, I think rehab after an MI or rehab after um, coronary bypass surgery or open heart surgery is is immensely important, mm -hmm. and for a lot of reasons, of course. Right, rehab is important for anybody recovering from anything. You have to get confident, balanced, stronger. But I think rehab also gives um, someone who's probably been scared and shaken to their core a human touch point and a little community that they can join that has something in common with them. So I think on every level that you can think of rehab, um, it's extremely important, in my opinion. Thank you. Couldn't agree more. Anybody else want to chime in? If not, I've got another question for the group. Okay, so one of our attendees would like to discuss cardiovascular, well, actually coronary artery disease screening. So how do you uh, uh, propose tackling screening for coronary artery disease in particular? <laughs> you wanna take that Dr. Brown or I can? I think he pointed at you. <laughs> okay. Uh, no worries. There. So I, I think for me, one of the biggest uh, indicators, and we all can talk about this, is family history, right? And so and then you also look at the company that keeps. So if you have other heart disease uh, in the family, specifically strokes, peripheral vascular disease, if you have uh, um, some metabolic uh, syndrome component, diabetes, et cetera, you're, the likelihood that you may develop this over time, just from a genetic standpoint, increases. And so those patients are already uh, tend to be higher on my radar screen. Um, that being said, there are several tools that uh, different hospital systems have developed to try to capture patients maybe at an earlier time point. One is coronary calcium screening. Um, and, you know, they're, they, I, I do think it's a, a great tool, but sometimes can lead to um, uh, unnecessary procedures. And so that's where I, I think it, it comes in. Uh, the, the physician has to be uh, aware of uh, scenarios where uh, we may be uh, exposing patients to a little bit more procedures than necessary because some of these tests can be what we call falsely positive. And so uh, at the end of the day, I think keeping your family history in mind, um, making sure that you see your cardiologist, making sure that they're aware and you are aware of your family history, uh, and then uh, uh, also trying to, to, to uh, optimize all of your other comorbidities, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, whether or not you know, you've had a stroke in the past, et cetera. Uh, making sure you take your medications from a screening standpoint, uh, it will kind of elevate you. And then we would know to target these patients or these individuals who seem to have a lot more of these comorbidities for uh, uh, more aggressive uh, tests. But we do have non-invasive tests for, for all comers who can come in and we can give you a sense as to where you stand on this profile of whether or not you're likely to develop uh, heart disease over the course of 10 years. Uh, so. I, I'd welcome Dr. Brown's point to Dr. Collins as well as Dr. Carter's because I think we could all speak to that. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really important to establish a baseline. So if you know that there's family, if, if you have a family history of heart disease, if your dad had heart disease early or your mom or your uncle, um, and if you know maybe somewhere there was a whisper at some point that your primary care doctor may have said, your cholesterol is a little high, but let's keep an eye on it. Just come see us, come see your primary care doctor, come see Dr. Finley. Let us just establish a baseline for you. You know, I, I, all my patients walk out of the room with just 
a set of numbers and just like a strategy. And, you know, I may say, come back and see me in a year. I may see we, we really need to work on this. Let's get a hold of this. I'll see you in three months. But if you don't have a, a, any idea of what you're working with, then you're kind of walking in the dark and, and there's no way for us to help you. And, um, you know, this is a, sort of speaks to Dr. Wright's point of tr trying to address our patients' needs upstream. Um, just establishing a baseline with us is, is incredibly important. Um, and that's, that's really the first step to screening is, is just the discussion and establishing sort of guidelines. I would reemphasize all of that and great comments at, at my segment of the continuum of care. I'm amazed how often we see someone with life-threatening anatomy and, and it was only found because someone scratched the surface when, just like you said, Dr. Collins, they, they heard a little something that was, uh-oh, hmm, maybe we better look. And that's what needs to happen because we live in an era where we have a lot of answers, no reason to play ostrich. Couldn't agree more. And I just want to say that uh, it's really important for people to know their numbers. I really appreciate what you said, Dr. Collins, because they you need to know your numbers. It's 28% of the people in Prince George's County are, are of adults um, have been diagnosed with a high cholesterol. A lot of people don't know that. It's, am it's amazing to me also with the people who have hypertension, the total three out of four people have been diagnosed with hypertension in Prince George's County. Are, don't have it under control. They don't know, and so they don't know, they're not, you don't know your numbers, and when your hypertension's out of control, we have, you know, 46% of the folks in Prince George's County, adults, are either at risk for diabetes or have diabetes. So we have a lot of indices that people need to keep up with. Their blood glucose, their hemoglobin A1C, their blood pressure, their cholesterol, and your doctor, your Regular primary care doctor gets these labs when you come in for a regular check. And you people should keep getting to their primary care doctor, know what their numbers are, and do the things that will prevent those numbers from going up. And to emphasize Something. that, the patient from just this week who needed um, open heart surgery had some preoperative labs checked and his blood sugar was 497. And then a, a subsequent follow-up, it was 350, to which we said to him, sir, can you please clarify how your blood sugar is being managed? Because it seems like we need to work on that. Yeah, it's all too common. Uh, Dr. Wright, this question is for you, my friend. Does the hospital provide community health promotion program, promote that health promotion programs? If so, do, how do you engage community member participation over time to ensure sustainability? Excellent questions. Yes, the, the answer is yes. And, and one of the beauties of, um, of the, the hospital financing system, we're not going to talk, this is, this is the, the only time I'm going to reference hospital financing here, but the, um, the, the state of Maryland is actually working under a pilot program with the Centers for Medicare of Medicare, Medicaid of Medicare in their innovation center. And, and what, it, what it is requiring hospitals to do is be responsible for the total cost of care, meaning uh, not just what happens in the hospital, but before you get to the hospital and after your discharge. So that requires that requires health promotion disease prevention programming to be in place at every hospital. And, and certainly we have a, um, a robust community health department that actually reports to me as the chief medical officer uh, to address all the uh, challenges that we're talking about tonight. Now, is the program uh, big enough? Is the program um, uh, supported to the degree that we need? Uh, of course, we could always use more. And so we partner to achieve that synergy. And I'm very proud to say that we have worked closely with Mr. Tate's team at the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden around uh, now our efforts over the course of the last 18 months have been around vaccine confidence. But pre-pandemic, 
uh, we had a longstanding relationship with the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden around our um, health promotion programming and other partners around the county, many of them faith-based, um, are ways for us to access uh, populations. And, and so we are open to creative ways. And, and certainly you mentioned, um, Dr. Collins, that the pandemic has, has forced us to be creative in accessing hard to reach population and even individual folks. And um, so uh, again, um, our efforts to engage community members is bi-directional. Uh, if there are partners that are willing to team with us and to uh, get out, we, are, um, we have been through the, the vaccination effort very mobile and working closely with Dr. Carter's team to get uh, to hard to reach populations. And, and we can certainly pivot that work uh, around other forms of care. Again, right now we're very much focusing on getting that last 30% um, uh, of, of, of residents in the county um, vaccinated so that uh, our numbers can be um, even higher with regard to the vaccine. But um, yeah, I mean, here we are obligated to be involved in health promotion disease prevention programming and, and welcome other partnerships. And, and again, Mr. Tate, I, I just wanna publicly acknowledge um, when we talk about partnership, the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden has really um, uh, not just the talk to talk, but walk the walk. And we appreciate the um, uh, the work that you all are doing and, and um, allowing us to partner with you. And this is Dr. Carter. I would, I would also just like to emphasize what Dr. Wright said. And this is an opportunity for, I think, the, for legislative funding because there's a lot of health promotion programs. They're small. We have 909,000 people in Prince George's County. And when I'm just talking about heart disease, I'm talking about 250,000 people. So in order for us to really do health promotion in Prince George's County, we need to have, you have to have enough funding to do massive, you know, not the small, not the same amount of effort that you do. You end up with 500, maybe 5,000 people you promote it to. We have to promote to, tens of thousands of people. And that requires funding. Absolutely. Dr. Ashton, did you want to tag, tag, tag on any kind of comment to that last question? Alan mentioned that you may have something else to add, but if not, that's fine. No, I was just going to add that um, as, a heart, as a heart attack survivor, um, listening to your body is extremely important. Um, you know, as someone who did not listen to the signs early on, um, I didn't really know what um, the signs were at the time, even though I, both of my parents both um, suffered from heart disease. My mother passed away from a heart attack. But as a, you know, as a, as a Black woman, I was 49 when I had my heart attack, but I didn't listen to the signs. I didn't listen to my body. And so for all the women out there who are anybody on this call, as a woman, listen to, listen to your body. That whisper will soon turn into a loud roar. And that's not what you want. You want to, you want to tackle it when, when it's at a whisper. And so the pain in my arm, the, the jaw pain in my mouth, um, the fatigue, the sweats, all of that was real. And I, did, I just attributed to stress and being overworked, but it took, you know, it took a toll, but thankfully, um, you know, I was, I, I'm a survivor, but as a, as a woman, I would say we need to listen to our, to our body because the signs are different. They're not the same as, um, as uh, for, for women as for men. So listen to your body. Absolutely. You are a warrior woman, Dr. Ashton. Well, we're, we're all out of time, guys. That was an incredible discussion. Um, I love the concept of wrapping our, our community services around our patients and our colleagues and our friends. 
Um, and please, patients, let us help you. There's so many incredible resources with this new hospital and, and the expansion of the hospital system. Uh, and our uh, us as healthcare providers, we're here to take care of you and to serve you, as Dr. Finley would say. So, Dr. Hutchinson, I'm passing the baton. Thank you, Dr. Collins. That was wonderful. Thanks to all the panelists. So we've heard over the last few minutes about the state of affairs, state of cardiovascular affairs in Prince George's County. And that is it, the statistics are dire. We also have heard that there are solutions available since the opening of the new facility, the Capital Region Medical Center here in the county. We've also heard of activities through some of our panelists that they're doing through their organization, all in an effort to improve the health of people in Prince George's County. So the point is, what steps can we take in the near term and in the long term to drive improvement for Prince George's County? How do we begin to change the narrative so that six months from now, a year from now, five years from now, we'll begin to see improvements in the statistics in Prince George's County, not only in heart disease, but in obesity, diabetes, and stroke. I do know that, uh, you know, most of the times when we have these forums, we always like to walk away with some type of call to action. We don't want to be known as just talking heads. We wanna have specific things that we are going to do in the next six months, in the next year, to impact or address the cardiovascular health. And so first I'm going to start with the health system. And if uh, Mr. Uh, Nathaniel, uh, is he still on the, is he still on? The president of Prince George's, if not, uh, Dr. Wright can take this question, is I think we all need to have some kind of call to action in terms of the health system in the next six months to one year, how are they going to address the cardiovascular health in Prince George's County in one sentence? So, oh, I see Dr. I see Mr. Richardson. Sure, thank you. Are you able to hear me? Cla loud and clear. Sure, well, what I will say is that we put forth five strategies to our corporate board and our local board related specifically to how we move the health needle in Prince George's County. Those five strategies were neurosciences, heart and vascular, women's health, orthopedics, and cancer. I have worked with Dr. Brown and the team now, Dr. Finley has joined us, Dr. Woodhouse, and we have a commitment, not only as an organization and a hospital, but a commitment from our board to make sure that we are addressing these health issues in Prince George's County. So what you will see in the future is more presentations in the community, more access with events, whether it's screening events, we will make sure that we get into the various entities in the community, whether it's churches, barber shops, and many other civic um, committee meetings that we can participate on to educate our community about this devastating disease that's impacting so many. And that's again, part of our five year strategic strategy that the board has approved. So with those five pillars, you can be assured that this is not something that we're just talking about anymore. Today, we have it as a part of our strategy and our plan that's been approved by the board. We have the capital commitment from the board, the operational commitment from the board. So for instance, you take Dr. Fentley, he's a structural heart doctor, Dr. Fentley, that we have not had in this community. We have performed some of the first cardiovascular procedures, complicated procedures that have never been performed in this community through Dr. Brown's leadership. And we will continue to build our cardiovascular presence across Prince George's, a county of over 900,000. So we have to be the leader in making sure that um, we put together the structure for our community. And we're proud to do that. Thank you, Mr. Richardson, for that commitment from the health system. And hopefully with that commitment, we'll have less residents of Prince George's County leaving the county seeking health care other, in other areas. I'll turn my next question now to Mr. Tate. 
you know, we've heard the wonderful work that the health ministries are doing in the communities uh, in Prince George's County. And I thank you for your service. How do you see the health ministries and other community-based organizations contributing to improving cardiovascular health in the county? Well, it's, it's very important for all of us to work together because um, a lot of us have been uh, operating in silos in the past uh, years. And so uh, we're really working to break those silos so that we can work together because when I is replaced with we, even illness becomes wellness. So it's important for us to uh, work together. And also uh, in the book of Hosea, uh, chapter four, verse six, it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And so that is one of the things that we have really honed in on is to educate uh, church members as well as people in the community about nutrition, providing nutrition education. Um, and even some of the classes that we've been able to provide with other churches, we even have doctors in our classes that are <laughs> learning about nutrition. And so we can educate each other, work together to impact the people of the community, to improve those numbers and those statistics that we see, um, because those numbers are far too high. And we want to have a healthy Prince George's. Um, I was blessed to uh, work on the coalition last year to uh, help pass the Healthy Kids Meal Bill, which is the most comprehensive bill uh, ever in the country when it comes to uh, meal bills. And so we're trying to work for to improve the health of children. Uh, teens, young adults, as well as seniors. And so if we continue to work together, we can definitely get those numbers down. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Tate, because we know as physicians, sometimes the patients may not come to see us, but trust me, they go to places of worship. They go to church. So I uh, thank you for what you're doing in the community. I'll shift next to the uh, Prince George's County government. Uh, if uh, Dr. Carter is still there. Uh, I wondered, what do you think, or what help do you think the local government uh, can provide to in addressing the health issue in Prince George's County for its um, residents, specifically? Well, well, specifically, the health department's goal is to not only organize the social structure and health systems and environmental structure, but it is to bring all those partners together and to come up with the system that will help us manage our populations. So the health department is committed to not only, number one is to develop population health management strategies that will help systems like the University of Maryland Capital Region manage their patient population through the partnerships that we form, which includes not only our community members, but government as well as private industry. And that's a big lift for us, but we're working very hard and we've made a commitment to that. We've, we've gotten a series of grants. One of the more important ones is a grant called Prevention Link that we've gotten from CDC. It concentrates primarily on diabetes and hypertension and, and we are, formulating the infrastructure that we need to make sure we can get people who are pre-diabetic into prevention programs, people who have diabetics to their doctors, to their specialists, to be sure they, they can manage their disease, train people to help people uh, manage their disease, help people with their hypertension. That's our goal. That's our mission. So the government has a commitment and is making a very strong commitment to make sure that our residents not only have the services, but also are literate to the services and able to utilize their services to optimize their care. Thank you so much, Dr. Carter, because the Association of Black Cardiologists who sponsored this event tonight, we have always had an interest in working with Black communities to improve heart health. And so Dr. Edward Ivey, who is the director of our community programs for the Association of Black cardiologists, I would ask him now to give us a summary of some of the activities that the ABC has been doing in health communities to address this cardiovascular issue. Thank you, Dr. Hutchinson. Um, as it was mentioned, my name is Donnell Ivey, and I'm, I am the Director of Community Programs for the Association of Black Cardiologists. As it was mentioned earlier by Dr. Underwood, the Association of Black Cardiologists has been working since the 1970s 
to try to improve health outcomes in the African American community and minority communities of color. Um, currently, we are on the Spirit of the Heart program, which is the flagship program to really bring awareness to the issues of cardiovascular disease in communities and to try to figure out a way, a path forward to improve care for individuals with, sickle, with, with, with cardiovascular disease. This program is really highlighting how do we develop that call to action to get other stakeholders involved and aware of the actions that need to be taken in the community in order to improve cardiovascular health. One of the other programs that we have is our Community Health Advocate Training Program, in which we work with faith-based communities, um, community-based organizations, and other groups to train lay individuals on how to use the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institutes with Every Heartbeat is Life Community Health Worker Curriculum to deliver the heart health message to the community. As it was mentioned throughout this program, there are barriers that exist in the community that prevent individuals from maintaining good health. And while the hospital is great as a resource for the community, we know it's not enough to truly address the barriers that, are, that confront our community that prevent us from achieving heart health. Individuals must be educated on the importance of watching the salt that's in their diet, on the importance of knowing their numbers, as it was said by Dr. Carter, on the importance of physical activity and getting enough physical activity daily on a daily basis in order to stay heart healthy. And the Community Health Advocate Training Program teaches lay individuals on how to educate other members of their community to, um, on, on that information. But we also know that educating individuals is not enough. There has to be advocacy that helps to address those barriers in the community. Because a lot of times that built environment stands as an obstacle to good health. It's difficult for individuals sometimes to get access to healthy foods when they're living in what's defined as food deserts. Or it could be difficult for individuals to get enough exercise when they're in an environment with, that has a lot of highways and not enough walking trails. So we use the Community Health Advocate Training Program to really get those individuals, those that know the community, to outreach to particularly those individuals that are hard to reach. We also have a barbershop initiative in which we work with barbers and beauty salon um, patrons to figure out how to me um, measure blood pressures within the community and educate the community on the importance of knowing their numbers and getting screened for the number, um, the risk factors for cardiovascular disease. As it was pointed out, there are a lot of individuals that have high blood pressure but are unaware, that have high cholesterol but that don't know it, or that are pre-diabetic but continuing to take beha have behaviors that put them at risk of cardiovascular disease. So by leveraging and using the resources that exist in the community, the ABC helps to work with partners to figure out how to address these barriers. So those are a few of the activities that um, the ABC has currently, and we're always looking for ways to partner with communities, to provide the communities with resources. We have a network of over 2,000 cardiologists nationwide, worldwide, to serve as a resource for communities. So we look forward to partnering with communities on implementing these programs so that every child can know their grandparents. Thank you. We have had a wonderful discussion tonight about the health of the people of Prince George's County and the importance of finding ways to stay healthy. We want all our children to have the ability to get to know their grandparents. But to do that, we must make sure that those grandparents are living long enough to have a relationship with their grandchildren. Unfortunately, too many of our African-American men and women are dying at a young age that don't allow them the opportunity to see their grandchildren. And the problem is not getting better, it's getting worse. President Barack Obama once said, change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. As we leave here tonight, let's think about how we can be the change for our 
Prince George's community. Let us con consider how we make that change right now, not tomorrow, not yesterday. Thank you to everyone that has joined us tonight in this important discussion. I would like to thank all our presenters. I thank Dr. Brown for really waking us up with those statistics of the state of affairs in Prince George's County. Dr. Wright, thank you for telling us all about the new programs that are available at the new Capital Region, uh, University of Maryland Capital Region Hospital. And Mr. R uh, Richardson, thank you for your vision and your commitment to the residents of Prince George's County over the next year to making a change in our statistics. And I would also like to thank our panelists, Dr. Carter, Dr. Finley, Dr. Ashton, and Dr. Wright. Uh, the discussion was very timely and very healthy. And thank you all again. I would like to give a very special thank you to all of our sponsors. That is the University of Maryland Capital Region, the Health Department of Prince George's County, and the Association of Black Cardiologists. And again, thank you all for sharing the evening with us. And I hope you have all learned or can take away pearls that could help to make Prince George's County better, change the statistics and improve cardiovascular health for the residents. Thank you again.